Okay, so keeping it moving, I, I mentioned earlier that um, all of us in the room care about rural health, and, and a few of us at least are somewhat famous for being outwardly passionate about it, and our next speaker is one of those people who has a hard time containing her passion sometimes. Uh, and uh, I will just tell you that uh, when I was at Phoebe, I kept hearing about Miller County Hospital and what they were doing down there. And when we started accepting transfers from Miller County Hospital to the Phoebe ICUs for patients who were on chronic ventilator care in Colquitt, Georgia, Miller County, Georgia, famous for one thing before this, and that was swamp gravy. Um, but I was like, wait a minute, they're managing these complicated ventilator patients in Miller County, Georgia. And so I got curious and I started having these conversations with Robin and she invited me down there when they were opening up a brand new dialysis facility that she helped kind of cultivate a collaborative relationship. And what I got that day was a tour uh, of what they were doing to not only preserve <coughs> access to primary care in a very challenging environment but to build a business model in a rural environment that was going to support that care and make sure that they were going to be able to continue that going forward so what we have here is someone who's an expert at bending the model yeah i think you're an expert so bending the model and making the model work by doing some things that were clearly outside the box. And so Robin, I always appreciate that. And I also appreciate the fact she's not afraid to shake a finger in my face if I'm not doing what she needs me to do. So right now, I'm giving it over to you. Here you go, Robin. Okay, so I am gonna try and stick to the subject matter and stick to the time allocation. But those of you who know me know that that is generally a challenge. I'm also going to recognize that you are recording this, and I am a Yankee. You may want to shut it off. <laughs> anyway, so um, so I'm going to go. What I what I intend to do today is kind of go through the genesis of what's going on in Miller County. And I know everybody wants to focus. I lectured a young lady from Irwin County earlier today. I know people want to focus on one program. But our pathway to survival had to do with a host of different programs. And as I said earlier today, if you focus on one, you're missing a lot of opportunity that really is out there. And I'm also going to say what worked for me may not work for the rest of Georgia. Um, as Tammy said, each of, it's not just critical access hospitals, every one of us, every hospital is unique to their community and the problems that um, that we're dealing with. So I'm going to give you um, the kind of the sad story about Miller County. This is this is what I walked into when I first went there. Um, Miller County Hospital had had s several years of multi-million dollar losses one after another, one after another, because sounds familiar to some of you. Um, but but um, by the time I got there, which was July 10th, I believe, of fiscal year 2008, um, we were like, you know, many, many Americans, we had an upside down mortgage. We had lost money after, I mean, millions after millions after millions for several years in a row to the point that we had negative liquidity like $11 million of negative liquidity. We had borrowed money to, to pay for drugs, for laboratory supplies, to pay employee salaries. When you talk about employees not knowing if they're gonna get a paycheck, they're working, they don't know if they're gonna get a paycheck. That's exactly what I walked into when I, when I sat in that position as the CEO, and I will never forget it. My CFO coming in my office I swear to God, I wasn't there 15 minutes, and she just came in my office sobbing was Jill Sheila. Um, Sheila Freeman from Spring Creek is here, so she can relate to some of these. Sobbing in my office saying, can, will you please help us? Can you help us? Can you help us? And, um, it, you know, and I've never forgotten, and weekly, if not daily, I remember those challenges. Those are the roots that humble me, if you can even imagine that I can be humble. Um, so so in two, 
So when I got there, um, we had just finished up um, fiscal year um, 2008, and um, and the hospital system had lost one and a half million dollars. We we had empty beds all over the place. We had empty beds in the hospital. We owned a 97 bed nursing home. I'd like to call it a skilled nursing home, but it certainly wasn't. It was more like a custodial living center. Um, the administrator of the nursing home at that point in time thought that her role was to set up a little desk in a hallway and paint the fingernails of our elderly residents. I mean, the facility, and I, I, I wish that Joel was here because the CEO prior to me thought that he was going to create at Miller County a medical center to compete with Phoebe. And, and my boy has seen me put this up so many times where I say, well, that was delusional at best. But that's kind of the culture that I walked into. Everybody was ignoring the fact that they had a gold mine sitting next to them, which was a nursing home, that had 30 some odd empty beds. And they had a hospital that maybe had seven patients in it, and they were fixated on making the hospital work. So, so the challenge to me was, and when I was interviewed by the board, and they said, what do you think? Do you think you can help me out, help us out? Are you interested in the job? Yes. Do you think you can help us out? I can only help you if you are willing to change. And you have to recognize that you are a hospital, a 25-bed hospital, sitting in a county at that point in time of 6,200 people. So probably one of the smaller counties represented in this room. We've now lost, because of, an, because of outward migration of our younger population, we've lost, in the eight years that I've been here, we're down, we've lost about 1,000 people. And who are the 1,000 people, who are the 5,200 that are left? They're people my age and older. So our community, just demographically, we all have this happen, but, but our community absolutely is much sicker, it's much smaller, and there's not enough engine, as I explained to my board, to drive this ship. And after years of dealing with the public and trying to get the community to understand, you have a hospital here. It can be your economic engine. It is what is providing, at that point in time, 150 jobs to you, to your children, to, to your grandchildren. You have to use it or lose it. After years of um, or about a year trying to get the community really to buy into what was going on and try and help support the facility and I was getting absolutely nowhere other than so frustrated I decided I have to kind of um, absorb my own theory and I also <coughs> had to move on I had to change I had to acknowledge that the community was not going to be there they weren't willing to put out two cents to save the place, and so I needed to kind of pick myself back up and move on. And that's, that's kind of the, the beginning of a genesis for me. So change was absolutely imperative. Like I said, I came um, July 10, 2008. That was the beginning of our fiscal year. We just ended another year, losing $1.5 million. We had a hundred, less than $100 thousand dollars in the bank when I took that and a payroll coming up the following Tuesday. Um, by 2000, by the end of that first fiscal year, we were able, and I want to tell you how I did this, but, but what I want you to understand is, is that by the, by the first fiscal year, we were able to, instead of losing a million, million and a half, 1.8 million, 2.9 million dollars in profitability. We only lost 750 thousand dollars. Now, to me, that was a minor miracle. My God, I have to tell you, if I ever got to that day today and thought that that was a good number, somebody would need to shoot me. Um, but, but that's where I was at that point, and I thought, oh, look at what we've done. How wonderful this is. So we also, within the first month of me being there, and I think it was my first board meeting, it may have been my second, but one of the banks called a $3.5 million note due. 
I mean, I'm getting nervous just, I don't know if I'm getting flushed, but I can tell you just the thought of that um, makes me nervous. You know, it just, I remember it so vividly like it was yesterday. Imagine a banker coming in and saying, you don't have $100,000 in the bank. I'm calling the note due. If you don't pay it within six months, I'm taking the keys to all of this. And as a CEO, and that's what all of you here recognize, as a CEO of your facilities, you are it. You are responsible for all the lives of the people, not just your patients, but your employees that are under your care, because literally everyone is under your care. So three and a half million dollars um, note due. Obviously, the first thing that I did is realize that the hospital was never going to make it with only 6,200 people in it. So let's let's do an easy fix. What I thought would be an easy fix. Let's look at the nursing home and see what we can do next door. One of the um, print, you know one of the principles that I have lived by is that they, I, I'm never going to be able to grow the population of Miller County. At least I thought I couldn't. I think we're kind of at a point where we're about to, but I can't really um, create create new people moving into my county other than through our nursing home. If I can fill those beds, that's 30 new people that would come into Miller County that would then be under my care, and I have just totally spilled this up. There goes that. There goes that Yankee language coming out. There you go, Joe, help me out. <laughs> Which one? The one to the right. Yeah, better work. That one. Do I really need this? Can you guys hear me? I think I have enough dust. I need it. Can you hear me? You good? Oh, for the lady in the back. <laughs> okay, so, um, so there were several things as well that I also recognized that we needed to do. We were bleeding like a stuck pig from bad debt. Um, and that's probably the, one of the biggest problems that all rural hospitals face. At the end of the day, you know, we all look alike. If you're in a rural county, you're off by one fraction of a percentage point difference between your educational attainment, your transportation, your poverty, all of those things, we all really do look alike. We, our patients are very, very, very similar. But I knew that our bad debt was a tremendous um, problem for me. And so one of the first things that I did, and, and, and it, it, it's no surprise that your bad debt in these rural hospitals comes from your emergency room. That's, the, that's really the artery that is bleeding. So looking at um, looking at an, at our emergency room in fiscal year 2009, I realized that we had way too many patients coming into our emergency room for toothaches, earaches, chronic disease, all of that, and they were frequently coming back. It was the same repetitious, same repetitious patients over and over again. That actually, for our little analyst in the back, I have to echo that yes, at, at the end of all of this though, you get down and you do a deeper dive over time and you realize it's not just chronic diseases unless you recognize that behavioral health is chronic as well. But initially, um, my intent was to pare down this uncompensated care. And so that meant I needed to do some work with case management. Um, or care management. Now I will tell you, I started doing this myself. Just like Tammy, I didn't have much of a workforce. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> let me just say that today, anybody who wants to come and visit us, I'll let you come. Okay, give, me, give us a call. I'll let you walk through there. I, I am so proud of our staff today. I think I have the best staff in the world. I, you know, I put them up against Joel's any day of the week. We have tremendous employees, but they are not the same people who were there nine years ago. They have all evolved. If they couldn't evolve, it's kind of like Darwinism. Sorry, you, you, you know, either go on your own or we're going to help you exit stage left. So when I first started all of this, it was me actually trying to do some redirection. Um, uh, you know, bad actors, bad players, people constantly came back into the emergency room because they had sore throat and earache or God only knows what, or they had a drinking 
problem, some kind of a behavioral problem. And I found myself so ensconced in trying to change all of this that I actually found myself bedside sometimes. Now, I would always bring a nurse with me, but I would try and do some of that education myself and try and get our population to realize that, no, this is really a serious problem. And so I'm going to come and I'm going to talk to you myself. So don't think you're going to be trying to run an end road around my nurses. This is now the CEO talking to you. I also then realized, had an epiphany one day, I said, no, I just don't need to be on CNN doing this myself. Um, and I really got worried about it. So I then went to Sheila Freeman, who is with Spring Creek Health Cooperative. She's in our community. I'd worked with her for years. And I engaged her organization to place an LPN in our facility and then directly engage those patients themselves. Now, they were basically doing the exact same thing. They were doing education, re-education, constant um, you know, chasing after these same bad actors, trying to redeploy them to primary care, medical home base. But it seemed a lot safer to me to have a third party do it rather than robbing of the CEO. The other thing that we also quickly realized is we had, I did it again. I am like so not good about this today. I should pick up that pen again. Maybe that would keep my finger off of this. The other thing that we also realized is, um, is that many of these people with chronic diseases, they, all, they had medication problems. And so we needed to help them with um, access to chronic disease medication. Spring Creek was able to help us with that, but I also knew that there was something else out there, and it was called the Recal Pharmacy. And so within the first few months of me being there, um, I hired a pharmacy director that I, I knew was a good, credible, valuable individual that I could work with. And we, we, we licensed, or got a license for a retail pharmacy for ourselves. Um, those, just those two things, redeploying and doing some case management for us, <coughs> made a 1% impact to our uncompensated care. And that gave us a direct impact to our bottom line of $200,000. That was huge for us. Okay, now what button am I about to punch? The one on top? Where's the? To the right. To the, to the right. right. Okay. There we go. Good job. All right. I'm in the slow reading book today. Do you want us to turn the lights out? It might help you. <laughs> no, I think I'm quick. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for that little pinch. Okay. We can reduce it by one percent. One percent reduction of uncompensated care led to a two hundred thousand dollar difference to our bottom line. And it was fairly simple. We're not rocket science. Part of it was so you have to give people choices. You know, if you if you can't just be punitive with individuals. I realized that early on. I had to, if I'm going to redeploy them and get them out of my emergency room, I also had to give them a place to go to. So by, by 2010, the fiscal year 2010, I also realized I've got to give these people that choice. I can't just chase them out of my emergency room. I need to give them now not just the stick, but the carrot. So, so in our rural health clinic, we created a sliding scale fee that was much more generous than what we already had, and it was 200% of the federal poverty guideline. In essence, what that did is it, it made that clinic truly a free care clinic. Um, that gave me the financial enticement to move our patients along um, over to that rural health clinic. We also renovated the rural health clinic to give us more capacity for patients. Those of you who run critical access hospitals, Lou kind of alluded to how the cost report also works. You know, there's two, two ways of success in a critical access hospital. And one of those is, you know, reduction, if you can reduce your bad debt, at the same time that you're reducing your bad debt, something else is coming up. So it's either going to be, so it's always going to be compensated. Is it going to be commercial insurance percentage, or is it going to be a program? 
And nine times out of ten, it's going to be program, which is only going to provide you with cost. Cost plus one percent used to be. But it's like you're at least going to get your cost. So if you drive down your, your bad debt, increase your program share. And at the same time, the other component of it is, but that's only cost. You know, if you if you get your if you get your bad debt down to just two percent, that's still two percent of your margin. And how do you make up for that? Well, the other way of doing it is then drive up because you, your program's not going to do it, your cost basis isn't going to do it. So drive up your commercial portion of it. So the other thing, at the same time, all of this is going on simultaneously. Then I also created a program, and I've got pictures of these cards here to share with you, um, where I approach several of our businesses. Now, in Miller County, there's not a whole heck of a lot of them, but there is a school system. There's, um, there's the county commissioners or county employees, the sheriff's office, there's Birdsong Peanuts. There's a few places, and what I did is I went to them, and I offered each of those businesses three sick visits a year for free to all of their employees. I don't care if they if they had insurance, didn't have insurance. I don't care if you were a bus driver for the school system, a janity worker, or the principal. If if you agree, I will provide all of your employees with a card that entitles them to sick visits at either of our rural health clinics. Now. That then drove volume to me that I was never seeing before. I already didn't have support when I went there. The reason why we were in such bad condition is we didn't have community support. They didn't use us. They looked at us as a, as a place for death and dying. So I drove paying volume to me. Now you can say, oh wait a minute, you just said you're giving them free visits. Oh yeah, I'm giving them free sick visits at our rural health clinic. But I'm going to guarantee you, if you show up with your child with an earache in my rural health clinic, all right, I'm going to give you give away a hundred dollar rural health clinic visit. But I guarantee you, that child's going to get an antibiotic, whether they need it or not. They're going to get a they're going to get a they're going to get a culture. Yeah. You know, Okay, so, so I'm going to make up for all of that. One, by a good patient care experience, new patients coming into my system, and I'm going to make up for it on the, on the back end. And so I'll show you, cop you know, copies of these cards. Um, and every year, they're only good for one year. And by the way, that card is good for anybody in your household. Whether they have insurance or not, I'm just going to be fair and free. Okay, so it's good for anybody in your household. It gets punched every time you come. Your last visit for your household, we just take the card and we pack <coughs> up the number of visits. The other thing that we also ended up doing is, I also said, okay, so if I have someone who comes into my emergency room with an earache, somebody needs to watch this on time for me too, because I can really go on. If, if someone comes into my emergency room with an earache and they have peach stay or Medicaid or whatever the heck it is, and it's not an emergency, uh, you know, a emergency visit, truly, then you're only going to get paid $50. So I quickly also said, well, wait a second. I'm not, we, we practiced. This was a practice. We practiced on these uninsured patients. Now we're going to quickly move along, and we're going to start dealing with all these insured individuals. Because I don't want $50 when I'm doing a CAT scan for someone who has an earache or a headache and it only shows up that they have an earring or headache. And I'm still getting $50. So we need to attack the insurance companies. Now obviously Blue Cross and a lot of them are now on board with all of that. But we also then started doing emergency room case management of insured patients. Um, by 2011, we really moved much more quickly into population health management. So Sheelam and Spring Creek was doing a lot for us with pharmaceutical assistance, but by 2011, we, we deployed the 340B program um, for use for our patients. Now, Sheila, her people still do, quite honestly, they still do a lot of medication assistance for us, but we become the bridge because there is a waiting period between application and actually receipt. So I can become the bridge. And also, um, 
you know, someone's in a hospital who's in there for uncontrolled diabetes, I have the ability to give them their medications, not just their medications, but it's their inhalers if they're asthmatics, it's syringes, whatever medical needs they have. That 340B program is so critically vital to us. Um, so we, we started using that in our case management um, and we provided free medication to insured, uninsured, <coughs> underinsured individuals. And in 2013, this is Gary, where behavioral health really started coming into play for me. So if you can kind of follow this, and I hope I'm being kind of succinct for you, but it was really a genesis. It was we, at Miller County, our key to success, I think, is that we constantly evolve. We make mistakes, we regroup, we huddle back up, and we evolve again to our next, next opportunity. So by 2013, um, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, 2011, that's when we partnered with Albany Area Community Service Board, Aspire, and you see them here. They do great, great work. Um, but we brought them onto our campus because we knew that behavioral health was a big part of what we were seeing. I can only do so much. I don't have all the tools necessary. So for me, partnership was absolutely critical. So we brought them into, onto our campus and asked them to help us out with emergency room management. 2013, Calhoun Hospital in Arlington. We, somebody mentioned Arlington earlier. That hospital closed. I will tell you that that was an example, and I've said it publicly, and I don't mind saying it here today. That is an example of failure of the community failure of a CEO, there was no reason for that hospital to have closed. That hospital should be open today. Um, if we now operate a rural health clinic in that, in that community, when that hospital closed, there was nothing left. Um, all the jobs were the ones, there was no primary care for anybody over the year. That is a better, better paying group of people than what I have in Miller County. So, that, that is just, when you talk about board oversight and involvement and, and CEO leadership, turnover, buy-in from a CEO, that was a classic exa example of how a community suffered because those things were simply not in place. By 2014, we really, um, we involved um, Aspire even more got them really involved in our frequent flyers um, in our emergency room. We realized, again, drilling down some more, that we're, while we're making progress, we're still having a problem. And so we needed Aspire really to do a lot more for us with that emergency room management. We connected them further with our primary care physicians. Um, they got involved with our mid-levels in our ER, with the nursing staff in the hospital, with our primary care physicians, and educating us so that all of us could recognize symptoms. You know, family practice physicians, I, at least mine, I can't speak for everybody else, but they are just not generally thinking in terms of behavioral health. They don't want to think about it, they don't want to see it, that's somebody else's problem, but we really got them to buy in with the help of Kay Brooks, who's the CEO of Albany Area Community Service Board. We also started exploring the possibility, remember the year before is when February 3rd, 2013 is when Calhoun Hospital closed. By 2014, Kay Brooks and I were already talking about an opportunity to reopen and repurpose Calhoun Hospital. And why? Because we all saw the need. You know, we could send somebody out on a 1013. And they may they go to a crisis intervention center, and it may be case, but, you know, a week later, they're back out. And these behavioral health people, we're delusional, you know, we're really delusional if we think that a brief stay in a hospital is really going to help them out. They come back out, and they get lost. And what kind of crystallized it for me was a, a man, and he was a patient of case, but he even got lost to aspire. He was a man that just had some, some kind of behavioral health processes going on, don't know all the details about it, but his behavior one day in Arlington 
he acted out so much that police were called. It was just he was he probably wasn't a threat to anybody, but he appeared to be a threat. And the man was actually he was killed. And that just resonated with me um, and said we have got to move a lot quicker on all of this. 2015. We did a joint venture with Davida Dialysis. Now, in amongst all of this, which is not on this slide, is in 2010, the other thing that I also did when we started working with our long-term care facility at Least Mill and Nursing Home, we started taking trait patients. My best friend was, um, was Grady Hospital. We would shuck ourselves up 75, go meet with them, we pick up patients, you know, you all see them coming down, they're on the underpasses. In January, they'll be freezing. They'll show up in Grady's ER, Embry's ER. They can't take care of them. They ultimately get discharged out of that emergency room or out of the hospital, and they end up ultimately on, on the, under those underpasses. Our first relationship was working with Grady and figuring out how can we help you help these people. Many of the patients we found ended up being trait patients. They were patients who, from bad choices that they made in their lives, they were homeless, they had, many of them had traits, etc. cetera. Um, and so we developed a program to help um, stop taking those patients. That was the beginning of our, what later became our VENT program. And it started in 2000. That vent or that trait program, can you imagine I have an administrator in my nursing home who thinks that her job is to paint the fingernails of these little cute silver haired ladies. We have nurses in our in our nursing home when I first came there who couldn't start an IV that had they wouldn't even take a patient with the G tube in that nursing home. So can you imagine going from what we had to do to go from that level of care, which by the way was substandard by CMS and Department of Community Health to now we're going to start taking trade patients and then eventually two years after that start taking vent patients. In 2017, well I'll back up, by the time we started with this entire vent patient program we also realized that there was another whole subset of patients that were being kind of ignored all around this region it was patients who not only won chronic care ventilators but also had needed dialysis nobody was able to take them anywhere nobody was willing to take them matter of fact it's very hard for a dialysis facility today to even accept a patient with a trade they simply won't do it um, so that was when everyone says about miller county's niche market it's recognizing what the need is for us where's the gap and can i evolve to take care of all of this so that's where the davida dialysis program came in again i said I, you know in all my healthcare career i've never run a dialysis facility i have enough knowledge to be dangerous so let me go find myself a partner who will work with me on it so we own the facility we're a partner in the clinical practice that gave me that other opportunity then to help out this other subset of patients who were um, who are kind of languishing out there. That, by the way, is how I met that man right there. Um, because he had a patient and heard about us. So that's how we all be came together. So this year we've got some redesign of our emergency room going on. Um, we are ex we are have expanded mental health yet again. I just bought them a, a building, um, meaning a spire, again. Um, which would be the third one, I think, third home that they've been in on our campus. Um, and um, it's been a great collaboration with them. So here's our economics. Um, when I first came there, we had, I don't know, maybe 135 employees. We now have 500. Our annual revenue is now 60 million. You know, not 18 million. Our annual payroll, just in terms of paychecks, is $20 million just for paychecks going out the door every other Tuesday. With benefits, it's 24 
million now. We have elected not to have any kind of rate increase at our facility. Not since I've been here have I chosen to increase our rates. I manage the facility by our cost report. We do analyze and look and make sure that we are not undercutting ourselves in any place. Well, what's the purpose of a rate increase? You, you probably can't pay it. And if you're in a critical access hospital, so Tammy's getting paid 30 cent, 36 cents on a dollar, I'm getting paid 55 cents on a dollar. No, but the dollar may, I did it again. <laughs> the dollar may be different. You know, her ceiling is probably different than mine. But that's, you know, I get a lot of public well feeling by being able to say, I'm not charging you $8 for a daggone Tylenol. It just simply isn't happening. It's unconscionable to me. But that's me. That's how I have run our critical access hospital, and we've been successful with it. Now, this slide is long. So think about kind of the genesis and timeline of what I told you. Um, by 2012, well, by 2000 and fiscal year 2009, after I've been there one year, we only lost three quarters of a million dollars. This bottom line right here in 2017 is long. It was, Sheila, if you repeat this, I swear to God. Okay, it was $6.7 million. One year. This year. June 30th, 2017. Look at this. Our uncompensated here, 2.8%. That, let me just say, for those of you who want to go, hey, I can't read that, but I know you're trying to tell me something. Let me just tell you, that is not the VET program. And that's my argument. Miss Irwin County, okay? That's my argument. It is all of these things that are out there. I'm not saying all of these will work for you, but, but it was all of these programs that worked. And the first, the biggest one that hit me was population health management that made the biggest impact. And it continues to have an impact on us today. So obviously workforce development, my God. You know, if you've got an RN who hasn't put an ID in somebody, how do you get from where I was to where we are today? Well, we do scholarships. We're a teaching facility with, I mean, for RNs, respiratory therapists, whatever the heck is out there, my God, we are part of it. The latest one now is going to be with Augusta University for medical students. Um, we, our average salary in our organization now is $45,000 a year. Um, so we can, you know, I mean, we're, I'm not afraid to pay people, but I also insist that they work, and I insist on quality. We do not, you know, I walk into a clinic and the doctors go, Achoo! here she comes. <laughs> I don't play. I can't afford to play. These are people's lives. So my tolerance is, and the fact that I am from, German background probably play, plays a lot. Health insurance reduction. You know, one of the things we also did, I heard a lot of the things to, earlier today. You know, we, we encourage our employees, we give them three years. We're partially self-funded for our health insurance plan. We encourage them to come. By the way, we've built our services based on the needs of our employees also. So someone asked me today, do I have a podiatrist? Well, part of that was, yes, I do. I have a podiatrist because of um, our patients in our nursing home. Um, I have general surgery because of patients in our nursing home. But I also know that those are needs of, an, of, our, of our employees. <coughs> Dentistry is something that we're working on right now. So we offer free care for anything for our, for our employees and their immediate families. We also. Did a, we went out on a limb um, and realized that there's a there's an area here called Cuthbert um, that the students the young people there part of the problem I see in rural Georgia is that our young people feel a sense of hopelessness I'm telling you it's sad they have a sense of hopelessness how did they get a job where did they get a job I would not want to be living in Fort Gaines, Georgia, 
next to a young African-American boy right now. And it isn't because of anything other than that young boy has no hope. That's my own personal opinion. They have no hope. They're born into a culture of poverty. There's not even a school system in that county. They have to be bused to every place that they go to. And so what, what does that young man grow into? Not somebody that I would really want to live next door to me because of the, the total sense of hopelessness, in, in my opinion. So I said, I'm going to be a part of that solution. I have two minutes. I'm going to be a part of that solution. And I said, there is a college over here in Cuthbert, Georgia, in that area. I'm going to give them a stipend. And I'm going to ask them to open up a nursing school, respiratory therapy, laboratory. Let's give these people an opportunity. Because healthcare is one of the most sustainable um, employment opportunities in America. And it certainly is growing in Southwest Georgia. So that's another opportunity for us. Now, here are our cards. Just so everybody can see them. You may plagiarize them if you want. I really don't care. OK, so here's, here's the Ed we tailor them to every single industry where you are eligible for free visits at our rural health clinics. And then here's our other one for um, financial assistance. This is our new pharmacy. We right now have $11 million of construction projects going on. And I say this again to Sheila because she is from my community and I keep a lot of this a secret until I unveil all of it. So we right now completed a brand new huge pharmacy um, addition. I right now employ six full-time pharmacists. This is our emergency room that is under construction. That is some of our site work. Um, that home, that building right there used to be part of a spire. It's no longer I knocked it down and bought a new home. This is one of our population health initiatives where we go out to churches. I'm not going to do a health fair in our community where, you know, we're, we're retired. Okay, so we're retired, affluent people can come. Hold on, Doug. I'm going to get finish up. Okay, we're, we're, we're retired, affluent people can come to. We're going to take it to where the health fair needs to go. These are to, to some of the churches and some of them are impoverished areas. Those are the people who need my help. I don't need you to come to me to get a free cholesterol check. You can afford to buy your own. There you go. And if you get diabetes, heck, I can treat you. And you probably have health insurance. That's right. OK, so this is, um, this is like how we appreciate our employees. All different kinds of things. We're constantly encouraging them and rewarding them for um, for the good work that they do. This is part of the Calhoun Hospital that has reopened up for behavioral health. 24 bed, the thing is full, and so is Miller County Hospital. Anyway, sorry. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a couple of minutes for a question or two. If someone has a question for Rob, after hearing that. So I'll just insert an editorial comment, if you will. Earlier the comment was made about closed hospitals and our focus on the data, the numbers around closed hospitals. Um, I will tell you that people in Miller County and the surrounding areas live better because there's a vital hospital in that community that's not only providing health and health-related services, but it's investing in the lives of people in those communities. So that's part of the resuscitation, if you will, to use a healthcare term, of a, of a failing healthcare delivery system in a very challenging demographic market. Part of our obligation as healthcare providers to give a rat's behind about rural health is to actually figure out ways, how can we become net contributors again to the overall improvement of health and health status in these communities? And that's the story of Miller County. I am taking advantage of that because we've now created a, a, a rotation in family medicine for medical students to go work in an environment in Miller County, and we're starting next summer with the next academic cycle, where students will go be immersed in an environment where these doctors are practicing in their clinic, they're practicing in the emergency room, they're practicing in the hospital, they're practicing in the long-term ventilator care, they're practicing 
all the way to the nursing home. And so this is an experience that they'll, they won't get anywhere else in the state of Georgia. That does not exist in a medical student environment anywhere else in the state of Georgia. So if you have one of those environments and you won't have medical students in it, send me afterwards. So anything for Robin? Thank Please. you, Robin. <laughs>